Hello. I'm Father Benedict Rochelle of the Franciscan Friars in the South Bronx in New York. And this is the final segment of a series that we've been doing on the topic, What Do You Do When Life Doesn't Make Sense? I really enjoyed doing this series because so many of us experience situations, sooner or later, which don't make the slightest sense at all. And perhaps if you stick with me and say some prayers for me, we might even make this into a little book. Because it's a topic that haunts us all. A religious person says their prayers. Our Lord says, ask and you shall receive. Says, blessed are they that walk according to the law of the Lord. And yet, people who are believers, people who are trying to do their best, often run into tragedies of life that are natural tragedies, sickness and death, or that are personal tragedies of their own where they fail, or where they are deeply hurt by the mistakes and even sins and even viciousness of someone else. So life is not so easy for any of us. Early on in this series, we dwelt on the idea that our Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, endured a world in which things did not make sense. St. Augustine warns us and tells us, don't expect to find in this world what the Son of God did not find. He found toil and hardship, challenge, suffering, and death. Don't expect to find something so terribly different. The secret is, what do you do with difficult, painful, even horrible things that happen? How do we go on? And we have seen that although we do not understand with our minds why the beautiful world must be so marred by these things, we at least see that God sent his Son to endure the very worst of them with us. Last year, a man wrote to me who was in prison waiting sentence of death. His name was Ed. Years before, almost a decade before, he and a crime partner had committed a murder in a holdup. They were both high on drugs. He had no memory of the entire episode. His friend said he did have the memory blamed him and was given life imprisonment. No, he was given 20 to 40 years. As a matter of fact, by the time that that first crime partner was coming up for parole, my friend, who had written to me, I never met him, was awaiting execution for something he had no memory of doing. He didn't know he did it. Now it is true that we should never allow ourselves to get into a state where we don't know what we're doing. There are people who will watch this program who have driven while they were drunk. There are people watching this program who have driven while they were taking drugs. There are other people who haven't done that, but they have done reckless things. They never awaited execution. Ed, who was executed in the state of Virginia last year, Ed paid the price of death. And I must say that I was very impressed by his last letters because he had accepted the fact that he would die for something that he did not remember doing at all and that he would pay this price. But he felt certain that he would enter into eternal life, that he would achieve salvation, although he deeply, deeply repented and accepted his responsibilities for what he had done. Life fell apart for him. And in much less dramatic ways, it can fall apart for any one of us. It can fall apart for you in your doctor's office when he says, oh yes, your tests came back and they're positive. It can fall apart from you when someone dear to you either dies or perhaps commits some terrible crime. It can fall apart from you and for me 
when any good thing that we have made a great investment in suddenly decompensates right in front of us and it's gone. Many, many people who are watching this program know what I mean when I say, when life falls apart. Our Lord Jesus Christ was there too. In Matthew, in the 26th chapter, we read, Then Jesus said to the disciples, You will all become traitors because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter said to him, Though all desert you because desert because of you, I will never desert you. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. And it was about to all fall apart for them. I suppose that we may live on the notion that somehow or other these things happen to other people, but we're going to be among the group that we're lucky enough that it doesn't happen to us. That's foolish thinking. A much wiser thought would be, yes, it may happen to me. And if I have beautiful things that I cherish, especially relationships, friendships, family, sooner or later, I'm going to take the risk, the very serious risk, that some of that will fall apart. That's true. The question is not, will it, but when will it? And for that, you must be prepared. Now, I've waited through all of these programs to get to the clincher. Our Lord says the things done in darkness will be preached on the housetops. The ha things done in secret will be brought to light. Yes, when everything falls apart, that's when you find out what a person thought about faith and life and death and God and themselves. That's when you find out what they think about their neighbors, those whom they know and love, those whom they don't know at all. That's when the score is tallied. And it's extremely important then to go through life with a vision of faith. It's important for faith to be part of your life every day so that when the whirlwind comes, you are prepared. This is what our Lord means at the end of the Sermon on the Mount when he says, whoever hears these words of mine and heeds them is like the man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came and the wind blew and the house stood. But the one who hears these words of mine and does not heed them is like the one who built his house on the sand. And the rain came and the winds blew, and great was the ruin of that house. What you are going to do when things fall apart is very much determined by what you do now. Years ago, I saw a very interesting film called Zorber the Greek. It was about a jolly green giant of a fellow who helps these very poor Greek people build a slideway to bring timber that they're harvesting down to the edge of the sea. Oh, it's quite a project. And it's this great big contraption going for a couple of miles down through the mountains right into the sea, sort of like a toboggan slide. And the whole film is about them building this thing. And finally, in the last scene, the Greek bishop is there to bless it as the first log goes down and everybody is praying, everybody's blessing the thing and the bishop sprinkles it with holy water and the log starts down and it gets to the sea but the whole contraption falls down behind it. The whole thing. 
And what does the jolly green giant do? Well, he's obviously a man of faith. And you know what he does? He dances. He does a folk dance. He celebrates the whole failure just as he would have celebrated the whole success. There's something very strong there because a person who has lived their life in the light of faith is able to evaluate things as they really are. And consequently, when things fall apart, they will be prepared. Cardinal Newman, in one of his sermons, the great cardinal of the 19th century, said that everybody who thinks tries to organize life around some principle. It may be the quest for happiness, it may be the quest for money, it may be the quest for peace and contentment, but everybody has a way of looking at things. And Newman writes, now let me ask, what is the real key? What is the Christian interpretation of this life and this world in which we live? What is given us by revelation to estimate and measure the life we live and the world we live in? And he says, the crucifixion of the Son of God. It is the death of the eternal Word of God made flesh, which is our great lesson on how to speak and think about this world. His cross has put its due value on everything which we see, upon all fortunes, all advantages, all ranks, all dignities, all pleasures, upon the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It has set a price upon the excitements, the rivalries, the hopes, the fears, the desires, the efforts, the triumphs of mortal men. It has given a meaning to the various shifting course the trials, the temptations, the sufferings of our earthly state. It has brought together and made consistent all that seems discordant and aimless in life. It has taught us how to live, how to use this world, what to expect, what to desire, what to hope. It is the tone into which all of the world's music is ultimately resolved. You've been wondering what is here on the desk. And I don't want this to be dramatic, although it is a dramatic image. I began this series by saying, I think it is unfortunate that we rarely see genuine crucifixes in Catholic churches. I think it's unfortunate that Protestant people don't have a crucifix around. And I suggested to everyone that someplace in their home there should be a painting, a picture, perhaps a crucifix, reminding us of what Jesus Christ did to make life have a meaning. Christ died on the cross. This is a very realistic, Spanish crucifix. I chose it on purpose. It is what gives a meaning to life. It is what gives life its whole tone and causes it to come together. It is, as Newman says, the sign by which we must judge the things of the world. Are you happy? Are you peaceful? Are you blessed? Remember, the cross will come. Are you sorrowful? Have things fallen apart? Are you beaten down and broken? Are you bitter, frustrated? Then look at the cross and see what the Son of God has endured for you. The ancient monks and nuns used to sing a song a hymn, O crooks, are they 
spes unica. Hail, O cross, our only hope. In the imitation of Christ, it says, in the cross is wisdom. In the cross is a joy that cannot be taken away. In the cross is the understanding of life and death. The crucifix shows us the worst thing that was ever done. Do you see this? It is an artistic reminder, limited as it is, of the worst thing that human beings have ever done. Oh, don't blame any particular person or people, because if Christ came back today, in some way this would happen to him again. Don't look for someone else because if you or I have participated freely in the hurting of other people or the undoing of good in the world, we have been accomplices. Don't blame the Romans, don't blame the Jews, don't blame anybody else. If you were there, what would you have done? Now, this is also an image of the best thing that was ever done. Isn't that mess fascinating? Isn't the cross mysterious? It's the worst thing ever done and the best thing ever done. It is pure divine love, agape in Greek. Christ reaped from the cross no earthly gain. He loved us when we did not love him. He did not think being equal to God something to be held onto, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Look at the cross. As you go through life, you will see that face many times. Oh, I've seen it so often in a hospital bed, in the waiting room of a hospital when I had to come out and tell people that their loved one was dead. I've seen it in the faces of poor children who were dying of, who were dying of AIDS. I've seen it in the faces of adults whose dear ones were dying of AIDS. I've seen it in the faces of people whose close relatives shocked everyone by committing a serious crime. I've seen it in the faces of mothers whose children went to prison for doing something they were driven to do by weakness, by compulsion, by obsession. Most of all, I have seen this cross when the powers of darkness have ground down upon human beings and made them do things that they never would have done on their own. I see this face in prison. I see it in the city street. I might say to you, in the words of the great mystic Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa, I see this face, these eyes, looking at me from every pair of eyes. Wherever I go, I see this face. And it makes life have a meaning. Oh, if you stopped here, it would be an incredible tragedy. It would have been the greatest failure of a consecrated life in the history of the world. It would have been the devil's bitterest joke. It would have been the proof that the cynic and the skeptic are right that life is horrible, that life is a mess. It would, have, it would have validated Nietzsche and Nicholas Lenin. It would have validated the carryings on of many of the people who sought to do good for the human race by brutally terrorizing people. If you stayed right here, 
It would prove that the weak lose and the powerful win. It would prove that good and evil come together, that there is no real thing dividing them. But it did not remain there. This image is important because of something that cannot have an image. The Spanish people sing a hymn, Resucito, Resucito. It's a sad hymn, Resucito, Alleluia. He is risen, he is risen, Alleluia. Of all the Easter hymns I ever hear, it is the one that means the most to me. And I've left instructions that if they want to sing hallelujahs at my funeral, they can only sing resuscito. Because the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is kind of a, a trick of God, unless it comes after this. It's the happy ending of a mysterious play. It's what the literary people call a deus ex machina, a god out of the machine. But this is no god out of the machine. This is a human being torn apart. Even this crucifix, with its Spanish realism, it really does not show you the event. Jesus of Nazareth died of suffocation. A human being stretched out in this way would rupture the esophagus and be unable to breathe. He died also of shock, of loss of blood, of whiplashes. He died of incredible pain and agony. On the cross, he thought of others. He said, woman, Behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He thought of his enemies. He said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He thought of the poor, thought of the poor, the weak, the broken. When he turned to the thief who said to him, Jesus, remember me today when you come into your kingdom. And he turned to him and he said, Today, you will be with me in paradise. I wish I could preach the cross and the resurrection everywhere. I know this broadcast will be seen by people who do not believe. I'm sorry. I wish I were good enough a man to help you believe. And I reproach myself deeply that I am not able to communicate to you the faith which has sustained me and many others in our lives. There are those who will watch this program who are kind of believers. Well, they sort of believe. Their faith has become lukewarm and deluded by the paganism and worldly ideas in which we are engulfed in our situation. Oh, sometimes they call themselves uh, positive Christians or hallelujah Christians or, well, you know, I I'm a Christian humanist. Oh, yes. Someday, if you're in New York, call me up. I'll show you a Christian humanism falls flat on its face. It has nothing else to say. It peters out. Christian humanism, any kind of humanism, is a decent idea. But it doesn't go all the way. This is something different. This is not humanism. There's nothing humane about this. It was bitter, wretched, miserable, unjust, and it is repeated 
millions of times in the world today. Jesus Christ is crucified among people who have never heard his name. He is the Son of God and he cries out in agony in Somalia where there are no Christians, in Bosnia where Christian and Muslim alike carry his crown of thorns. He cries out in every place in the world where innocent people, unborn and born, young and old, endure the terrible mystery of evil. And he rises from the dead. I know that my Redeemer lives. I wish I could take you on Easter Sunday down through the dark streets of the slums and in old stone churches and little corner store churches, storefront churches, there's rejoicing because we know that our Redeemer lives. The Son of Man will go up to Jerusalem, Christ said, and he will be given over to the hands of the Gentiles. He will be mocked and scourged and spit upon and when they have mocked him, they will put him to death. But on the third day, he will rise again. And that is the answer.